Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ooh, Wellbeing in the Workplace session. I'm sure it will be very interesting and very informative. My name's Rachel Hollins Head Walker, and to my right, first we have Professor <laughs> I was say Elizabeth then Elizabeth Libby Burton, and second we have Professor Franco Cappuccino. And right on the end, we have Professor Nick Chater, who will introduce themselves and their background and interests more fully shortly. So this morning, the panel will be bringing together a variety of perspectives to discuss issues relating to well-being in the workplace, looking at the effects upon our well-being in relation to the environment in which we work, our sleep patterns, diet, and how decisions we or others may make input impacts upon our working environment. The format of the session will firstly include an introduction to the topic area, the panel, who again will say a little bit about themselves and the perspective they'll bring to the session, and any opening thoughts. Audience participation is strongly encouraged, and we do have roving mics here for any questions or issues you would like to raise, or any experiences you'd like to share. The session is anticipated to last around 45 minutes. We are running slightly late, so we will crack on with it. So first of all, I'll, I'll start off by giving you some introductory facts and figures and information around well-being in the workplace. Um, well-being in the workplace is becoming an increasing area of concern for both employees, employers, health and other related services. One in six workers is experiencing depression, anxiety or stress, which is costing the UK economy up to 26 billion per year in reduced productivity, lost working days and staff retention, staff leaving. We spend on average 60% of our waking hours in the workplace, so that's over half our lives almost, and during that time consume a third of our daily calorie intake. What we choose or how our, what our actual choices are in work are, are an issue. Um, what we choose to eat and drink affects our physical and mental health, in turn affecting, affecting our pre professional performance. Factors which impact upon well-being in the workplace are wide and varied, and they include the environment itself, the physical environment, as well as the psychological and social environment. The relationship between sleep patterns, diet and physical health also have a major impact upon the working environment, as does decision-making processes at work, either by the individual, the impact on the individual, the managers, the employers, for example, in relation to managing change and continual cha change in the workplace, all of these factors can compound an individual's well-being in the workplace. For an example, if an individual is stressed at work and feeling depressed, this can affect eating and sleep patterns, decision-making, physical and mental health. Equally, not eating properly in the first place or not getting enough sleep or not being able to make those lifestyle choices, the environment and the lack of participation in decision making can contribute to poor mental health and well-being manifesting itself. So that's just an introduction to our session. I'll now briefly introduce myself and then I'll move on to the panel who will introduce themselves. So my name's Rachel Hollinshead Walker. I've spent 15 years working in the mental health field, working with children, young people, adults and older people. Uh, the children starting generally, well, from babies, because my interest is in perinatal and parental mental health, through to school age, to young, young people, adolescents, adults and older people, both as a practitioner and as a manager. I'm currently a senior manager at Coventry and Warwickshire Mind Mental Health Charity with a lead responsibility for supported accommodation, stress and anxiety management services. I have a degree from Coventry University in Social Science, which I got quite a few years ago, um, and a Master's in Social Work from the University of Warwick. My, as I said, my current interests are perinatal mental health. I'm currently studying at St Mary's College in London 
for a BSc in clinical hypnotherapy. So that's myself, and I'll move move on to Professor to Professor Me? Franco. Oh right. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Franco Thank Capuccio. You. I'm um, uh, work in the medical school, and uh, I trained in medicine. Um, and then specialized um, in cardiovascular medicine throughout my career and then in epidemiology and public health. Epidemiology is a science that studies the pattern of disease in populations rather than individuals and the impact on public health. Um, my interest in research lies into the effects of lifestyle and, and diet in general uh, in relation to both well-being, so the, the preventive aspects of lifestyle and diet, but also in the causality of ill health, how much some of these factors may cause ill health in different circumstances, particularly on chronic conditions. Uh, and I, um, in the last few years, have been heading the WHO Collaborating Centre for Nutrition based at Warwick, and I engage quite actively with WHO globally for some public health policies on some dietary and um, nutritional aspects. I think my major interest in one thing, as an open thoughts for discussion later, um, uh, rotates around the dichotomy, uh, the contrast between how much well-being or control of ill health is due to personal choices uh, and how much is in fact due to the presence of an enabling environment, sometimes independent on the individual, which can empower the individual then to make healthy ch choices. Thank you very much, Professor Capuccio. I hope I've got that pronunciation right. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce Professor Libby Burton. Thank you, Libby. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm actually an architect and urban designer by background. But when I trained as an architect, I quickly became very disillusioned because I kept being told to stop thinking about people when I was designing and to think about the building of sculpture which is not why I went into architecture. Um, so what I've done since completing my training is to take up an academic career. And in 2004, I set up the WISE Research Unit, which stands for Wellbeing in Sustainable Environments. And the aim of that research unit is to find out how the built environment at all scales, that's from your home to your workplace, the streets we walk along, the neighbourhoods we live in, how those aspects of the built environment affect us as people, our everyday lives, our happiness, our quality of life, our mental health, even our physical health. Um, and so we're trying to find out the knowledge that we need in order to be able to design better environments. Um, so I've come to Warwick, um, I've been, only been here for about 18 months now, but what I want to do is set up um, a new, new set of courses and programmes which provide an alternative to the current kind of education that architects get, because architecture at the moment is very much an art, and I think actually what we need to do is bring back the people element to architecture. Because what we know now is actually there's quite a lot of evidence that where we live, where we work, the environments we spend our time in actually do make a significant difference to our happiness and well-being, even our physical health. The problem is having that knowledge isn't going to make any difference unless um, we use it to change the environments we live in. So what I'm trying to do is promote what I call design for well-being in the built environment. Um, and that involves training a new generation of designers who know how to do that, that they put people at the centre of the design process and they use evidence of what works and what doesn't. Because you find in the past, the modernists, for example, they did have a strong social agenda, they did want to make life better for people, but they got it wrong. You know, look at the, the concrete high-rise tower blocks that people still live in. Um, they got it wrong because they used their own ideas about what would work rather than tried and tested measures or any evidence. So what I'm trying to do is um, em encourage an approach which uses evidence as the basis for design. So that's where I'm coming from and that's what my interest is in this area. Thank you very much Libby. Now I'd like to welcome and introduce Professor Nick Chater. Great. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Rachel. So, um, my name is Nick Chater. I'm Professor of Behavioural Science and Head of the Behavioural Science Group at the Business School. Uh, my background is psychology, so I was in fact a professor for nine years at Warwick before going to UCL for five years and then finally coming back again. And um, the 
uh, the, the, the project that we're engaged in at the business school is building an interdisciplinary group of economists and psychologists to try to understand uh, economically relevant human behaviour, but from a point of view which is much richer than that taken by standard economics, which actually models the, uh, some of the crucial elements of the psychology of individual behaviour to understand how uh, business and economic uh, decisions get made. Um, in the context of well-being in the workplace, uh, there's a lot of work, much of it done at Warwick, on issues of well-being and the determinants of well-being. And I want to highlight two factors which are particularly work-related. One of which is uh, having a sense of a meaningful purpose, a kind of clear sense of uh, what the, the uh, uh, objectives you have are. And one issue that arises, I think, a great deal in, in the workplace is uh, people being very unclear about what their goals are or having multiple conflicting goals, possibly driven by either the same confused manager or possibly different uh, forces within the organisation. And to the extent that you have these conflicting goals or goals which are impossible to fulfil, then that's, uh, that's extremely difficult to cope with. And the other big, so one determinant of happiness is uh, having a meaningful, a meaningful sense of engagement with, with, with goals that you, you believe in and can achieve. The other uh, one I want to mention is uh, social relationships, which are very important at, at every, every aspect of, of human life. But in the workplace, of course, those relationships are also mixed up with relationships of power, and that can be very difficult to deal with. Um, so I think the, uh, the degree to which we can design organisations and working environments so that people can feel comfortable and have natural um, cooperative social relationships while still achieving a coordinated activity that's required of a, of a, of a, uh, a corporation or a government department or uh, any other uh, kind of grouping of people who have to work together, that's, that's a real challenge because obviously um, the purpose of organisations is to achieve goals which are not necessarily the goals of the individual person and to come to views as an organisation which may not be the views of the individual people within that organisation. So that is a sort of drive to, um, to coordinate people and to uh, act as a coherent organisation which is inherently at some extent in tension with uh, our natural, uh, natural social relations. Um, so I think uh, you know, those, those are sort of two big, big forces that are, that are in play, which I think are very interesting to explore. Okay, thank you very much. Have we got any initial questions to any of the panel? If you'd just like to raise your hand and then the roving mics can manoeuvre around. Well, I've got quite a few questions, actually. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. <coughs> so what's your... What's your view on open plan offices then? <laughs> That's me, me probably. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, well, research has been carried out on the effect of open plan offices versus what we call cellular type offices. And yes, we do find that open plan offices are worse for well-being than cellular offices. Um, I think it's probably a bit more complex than it just being good or bad because it depends on how it's designed. And one of the problems with research in this area is you tend to look at very broad characteristics of the environment without looking at the details. So it may be that an open plan office would work if, for example, people were able to personalise their own space and create their own little micro-environment. And we also know, actually, that medium-sized and small open plan offices are worse than the big ones. And I think the reason for that is that in, in a big open plan area, you've got a general buzz in the background of noise, which hides individual conversations. Whereas if you're in a, you probably all, all of you experienced this, I, I certainly have, you know, if you're in a, a small area that's open plan, one conversation, you can't help but listen into it, you know. So um, yeah, we do know that open plan is bad. Thank you very think much. A, another, another thing, to, just to add to that briefly, that people often report is the feeling uncomfortable by being continually under observation. So certainly a lot of very open buildings with lots of glass in them, even if they're not open plan offices, uh, where everyone can see everybody, everybody else. And I think for many people that makes them extremely uncomfortable. So I think uh, there's another sort of factor. One is the sort of background noise and intrusion, but the other factor is just feeling you don't have a proper private hidden space. Yeah, and the other, other thing to add to that, Nick, is that unless you have the privacy you need, you tend not to want to interact with other people, so you don't get the good relationships with other people either. So you have to satisfy that privacy need first. Mm. So a compounded effect there, really. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a question, 
Have you correlated that with organisational performance in terms of the, the office design and team performance? Is there, a, is there a link between the design of the office and the team performance <laughs> at the other end? Well, certainly in terms of productivity, if that's what you mean, um, workers are less productive in an open plan environment. And it also matters how many people there are in the space, so the density of the space, how many people per square metre. So if you've got a packed open plan office, productivity is significantly lower. So you could make an economic case for changing it. Thank you. Uh, just to pick up on that point, um, having worked in open plan for most of my 30 years, I'm, I'm surprised with, with that conclusion, uh, particularly for teamwork. Right. Open plan is can be very productive. I, I take your point on privacy. There is a balance, yeah. but I think I've found where environments where people have had their had this opportunity to have their sort of private conversations or private calls in a separate place that's, that sort of work. Yeah. But I'm surprised that open plan wouldn't be. Uh, yeah, well, you're, you're quite right that. It's a good point. That's what I was saying before about it being more complicated than that. And actually, the space has got to be fit for the purpose, and, and it depends what sort of work you're doing. So, you know, if you're in a design advertising office, you know, it's a lot about image and style and the impression you give to the client. You know, that's all important. You, you might be in an environment where actually you want to encourage ideas, the exchange of ideas between people and so you know it depends what sort of work it is for some work yeah the exchange between people is really really important and that's something else we've been looking at is how do you create an environment that allows people to interact without disturbing other people it's, it's very complicated but you're, you're right that there are some good aspects to open plan spaces I mean another thing to add on that is the the importance of optionality so if you're if you can only work in an open plan space where there are people all around you and you have something to do which requires intense concentration like you know, writing a you know, briefing paper then that's a, a nightmarish experience so in an environment where on the other hand you can you can you, know, you can work from home you can you know, work in uh, secluded areas or you can work in an open plan as is appropriate then that's a very different kettle of fish so I think the degree of flexibility people have about how they distribute their work makes a, you know, has, a has a big impact and it certainly is absolutely true that um, when people are separated they also report great um, actually quite a lot of symptoms of stress and, 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 and distress it's not a, a pleasant environment for everybody to be in a sealed box if they have no sense of humanity around them at all and certainly many old-fashioned office environments do have that quality. I think that it's an important point as Nick says because actually what's crucial is having control over your environment so I think the reason why open plan offices often come out as negative is because people have less control you know can you open the window can you you know change your space and make it suit your needs for that particular day but if you changed open plan office design so that you could have more control over it then they may work perfectly fine thank you just a final observation on that I, I do notice the behavior where some people wear headphones oh, right. to do that yeah mm -hmm. thank you very much um, it interests me about workplaces being taken into environments that perhaps there were never before. For instance, the train. I went to London recently and I find I'm sitting at a table and I'm in a, in a business conference. Now that in itself is impacting on me and I'm not even working there, so that perhaps is a, another thing to consider. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I'm not sh I mean, people have been looking at the implications of working from home, but I don't know about extending it to those more public environments. I think that would be really interesting, actually, to explore. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Nick, do you know? No, no, I, didn't, I, I mean, I know there's a little bit of stuff, uh, there's, a little, there's actually a lot of research in, in basic psychology on the effects, of, the stressful effects of interfering noise. So if you are the person on the, uh, you know, uh, mm. just inadvertently listening into a business meeting, then that is a, that is likely to be quite difficult because it's actually very very um, mentally effortful to block it, block out um, information. Uh, so either you have to listen to it, which you don't particularly want to do, or you fight it, but you can't really fight it. So it's, it's actually a very stressful experience. So there's no question that that's that's a, a, a negative thing. Mm. Uh, for the question of how productive people are in transit, that's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm sure there must be work on it. I don't I don't know what it is. Um, that's not an area I've ever looked at. If I if I may just um, take uh, 
the opportunity to move into uh, another aspect. I mean, the, the example of working on, on the train is probably the, the, the obvious aspect that everyone can see in terms of moving the working environment into new spaces. Uh, that is a time for traveling, it's not time for working. Now, that opens up the idea that we've been studying in terms of uh, the effect on well-being uh, and the reduction in sleeping time over the last 50, 60, 70 years in the Western world. Uh, and if you were able to peep into somebody's house, you probably realize that more and more people uh, work it late in the evening or in the early hours in the morning, finishing off their report, using the computer in bed, or checking the latest email before switching the light. Now, that has been shown very clearly to uh, in, um, encroach into a time where you should spend being asleep. And that's what we've been studying. And this is one other aspect of sleep, not only in the working place, related to shift work and uh, this is, uh, work at night or in extended hours, which is a well-established science, and there are some deleterious effects. But the more subtle uh, curtailment of sleeping time is the only commodity you can trade off nowadays, can you? Now, you have your busy life, you have to get up in the morning, you get your entry time to work or to school for children. Uh, it's all very much into boxes. And you come home and that you're shopping, then you get to cook your meal if you're a mum, and then you need to have a bit of your social life. And w where you can squeeze things in your sleeping time. So if you notice over the last uh, 60, 70, 70 years, populations have reduced their average sleeping times from an average of nine hours per night to what is less than six hours per night. And, and, and our research has shown that this is really uh, bringing over a lot of uh, um, consequences, not, not only in the short term, you know, your tiredness, your fatigue, which uh, in a working place reflects in loss of productivity, efficiency, uh, but also in the longer term, we're now showing a greater incidence of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, uh, and other conditions of that kind. So in reality, going back to your example of the train, really uh, brings to my mind that a lot of people bring their work at home in spaces that should not be taken by. And that brings it back to how much is a personal choice, how much is an enabling environment. Uh, my personal feeling and the research we do is that a lot is due to outside pressures. So you, we don't have an enabling environment. Demands is greater and greater. Traveling time is greater. For instance, you spend more time to go to work, for instance, and we go back to how to enable an environment to get you to work, not only in, in a healthier way, by bike or public transport and, uh, and greener uh, means of transport, but also in the quickest possible time, so you can maximize your time. Uh, so I'd like to know whether does anyone has any ideas or any questions or observations on this yes. particular it's, aspect. It's very interesting, the dichotomy mm. that yourself has pointed out in that um, lifestyle choices and the individuals may be aware of those lifestyle choices and fully educated around those choices but unable to implement them for, for very various different reasons. The uh, external constraints of lack of control o over those, pressure from work and... Y y you talked about sleep, um, and I'm sure kind of diet would come into that. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, you. actually, it's hard to know which way it goes, whether it's working longer and more efficiently and trying to pack as much in the day as you can, or rather, whether it's actually working more flexibly, enabling you to have a better work-life balance. And I wonder what your views are on that, on which way it's, it's going. I think, I think you're quite right that there are two forces, that the two, two phenomena running along side by side. So to some extent... The boundary between work and leisure is becoming increasingly blurred, and technolo technology is, is increasing that degree of blurring, and it will do so even more. So it, it's going to be you know, increasingly difficult to um, to make a distinction between work that has to be done in the office and work that has to be done at home. So that can be dangerous because it can make everybody uh, feel that they have to be on a sort of permanent uh, standby to work at any moment or to catch up on all the work they didn't do in the office. Uh, but actually, I think on the, in the long term, I think there's actually a positive, um, a positive opportunity there, which you pointed to, which I think is actually greater and will overwhelm the negative uh, if, we, if we, we as a society take the right choices anyway, which is that it allows us to, uh, to work and actually conditions, again, going back to the issue of choice, it allows us to work when we want to work. So, so an enormous amount of work, quotes work, 
uh, inverted commas, is actually um, spurious from the point of view and irrelevant to the, for, the, for the purposes of the organisation. A lot, lot of it is, in, in economic terms, a thing called signalling. So it's me doing something expensive uh, and costly to me to show that I'm committed to you as a manager or to this as an organisation or whatever it may be. So me meetings are classic examples of this. So uh, you, you go to meet, if you're, if you're a, a business person trying to sell a contract, you have to get, you fly to Frankfurt, you go to the, see the client, wherever they may be. Now the value, you, you, might, you could do that from your living room without, you know, without even leaving your house, and, and, and indeed, indeed increasingly I suspect this will happen. But the, one of the reasons you have to do that, I mean, we've always had the phone, at least for a very long time, the reason you have to go for, for that costly process of signalling is to say, I really value you, I think you're really important to me, and it's really costly, and cost, and you know, and I know, this has cost me an awful lot of time, and that shows how much I care. Now, you know, the degree to which we are able to unravel those kind of pointless pieces of work, um, you know, we have a real opportunity. Technology gives us a real opportunity. Another aspect of signalling is being in the office early and leaving late. Mm. And I think technology is going to slightly, it's going to gradually break that down because it will break down the relationship between office time and amount of work you do. Because to the extent that people are working remotely, then it's, in, it's imperative for managers to evaluate their workers on the ground, on the basis of what they actually did, because they can't just watch them in the office a lot, but if it's a, uh, taking many hours of uh, labour to do it. And to the extent that that's true, then you know, mere, mere presence is, it becomes irrelevant. So I think, I think that, that, that we have to go through a big cultural shift and these signalling kind of issues, me sort of showing my commitment by burning up lots of my time pointlessly, uh, these things you know, have to be, have to be uh, you know, gradually uh, squashed out of our sort of business and government culture and we still have a huge way to go. But I think there are real opportunities. So in the long term, I'm actually quite optimistic. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd just like to actually uh, sort of... Uh, move on from that. I mean, I actually work for a company that in the last 10 years has moved substantially into the east coast of America, and it's also outsourced a large part of its back office functions to India. So I actually tend to have quite a, at the beginning of the day, it's sort of talking to quite often people in India. At the end of the day, it's actually America, and the Americans and Indians have quite, because of the actual time shift there, the other side world, actually great difficulty if they do have to communicate with one another. Do you foresee that being a focus, which does mean that I do, well, in fact, last weekend we had an IT upgrade. I did spend the Sunday morning making several conference calls from home, which was much more preferable than going to the office. Do you foresee that that is the way, I mean, certainly the way we've moved forward, and I can't see, certainly at the senior level, that changing mm. as we become a more global mm. types of organisations and expectations of that? Very, very quick, quickly on, uh, from my side on that, um, I, I was at a conference organised by IBM yesterday about greening the world. I, you might wonder why IBM. Um, actually quite an interesting, interesting meeting. But, um, but one of the things that IBM are doing, as, and you, you may well be very aware, is they are moving away from having offices at all. So a very large percentage of their employees now work from home, and they are absolutely actively encouraging it. Um, essentially on economic grounds, it's just cheaper. They don't have to spend all that money on offices. Um, but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but of course they have this extraordinary global work, workforce. So you've got this very, very strange phenomenon of a giant global corporation distributed across the world where a very large uh, proportion of its um, growth, and indeed now current employees are in India, uh, but you've got a, this big centre in, in, in the US and to some extent Europe. You've got this enormous global th global organisation which is uh, you know, which is which is working from the homes of its employees across the world, struggling with all these different time zone issues. I think that's very much the way. I mean, IBM if, if IBM is doing it now, then uh, we'll all be doing it in you know, five or ten years. If I may just pick up on this and <coughs> another aspect, which is more into the sleep wake cycle oh. and the balance of our uh, metabolism and life. Um, there's one clear example of studies carried out in the City of London where obviously within the, the global markets there are individuals, they, they, they start working at midnight and, and uh, stop working at 8 o'clock in the morning to look after the East Asian countries' uh, markets. Now that is one of the reasons, if you study them, they, they, they have a very short lifespan in terms of working life. They can't work for longer, uh, for long times in those kind of rhythms because it's totally against your body clock. Now, if you look at the biology, uh, it's not easy for your body to adapt to uh, an upside down day. You know, if you travel to Australia, it takes probably uh, 24 days to adapt to the new body clock very slowly and steadily. But if you do it in, in an environment where you work at night 
and you're supposed to sleep during the day, you will, you will turn your metabolism upside down and the effects will be dramatic. I mean, the extreme will be heart disease, strokes, high blood pressure, media, depression, obviously is one, one thing, insomnia. Now, that is an indication that when working from home, I can see the, the great potential, provided the, there is an indication and a study on how far you can go in handling your timing. Because if you're left on your own, you can take patterns of work, although in your own environment at home, which is apparently comfortable, that will lead you to a very unhealthy lifestyle, although it's from your home. There are studies showing that, for instance, there is a certain number of shifts you can do before you really uh, start building serious damages to your health. And we've done studies in junior doctors, for instance, were, were triggered by a new European working time regulation that was reducing the total number of hours of junior doctors can work from 56 to 48 hours per week. Now, that is on the, on the uh, understanding of health and safety issues, both for the doctors themselves that can do harm to themselves, but also for the implications of risk for patients. Because if you work beyond a certain time, you accumulate fatigue and tiredness, your efficiency, your way of articulating even procedures uh, declines, you can do harm. And we showed that by reducing working out, we were improving the medical errors by 33%, by a third. In other words, if you prolong shifts, you go into an area of a high risk if you have a shift longer than 11 hours. Commonly, the doctors work 13 hours shift, in the States up to 18 hour shifts. And it's clear that between you know, 1 and 10 hours, the rate of errors, the alertness is comparable. And then you have a very, very sharp rise. Most of the medical errors happen in the last three hours of the shift. Now, these are issues that are not recognized worldwide. And I think there is a risk that if you leave it to the positive attitude of passing on to your home environment, which obviously is very good for the individuals, you might leave it totally uncontrolled in terms of how much you can build of safe routines of those kind of uh, um, um, uh, working on practices. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about how the transition between work and non-work, and as we have more flexible things, we kind of lose that kind of preparing to work and then winding down from work. And if any of you had any kind of thoughts or research into how you can build that in if you're, say, working from home or something like that. I'll pick off with a small I, I, point, which is related to health, and then I'll pass it on to my colleagues. Uh, well, preparation is important, for in, particularly for those uh, that do shift work or work late against your body clock. It's not the nine to five. And within, for instance, the study we did for doctors, part of the preparation to a night work would be to have naps. Uh, that will potentiate your alertness and make you ready for the night shift. Preparation means also rest and not having uh, alcohol intake, not having uh, intense exercise before going, but that will be uh, detrimental to your alertness, your preparation. So there are uh, practices in your, in your routine which will be quite important, for instance, for shift workers, they're not always built in, in the schedules in different, in different um, uh, occupations. That's one example of what preparation is important, knowing the health impacts. There's also a theory called attention restoration theory. I don't know if you've heard of that, but um, it's this theory that we have a natural um, affinity with nature. And I mean, it's quite, been quite well tested as well. So if you um, have a view of nature, greenery, trees outside your window, um, if you look at that, uh, then, or spend some time in that environment, you can restore your energy much more quickly than if you're not in a more natural environment. Um, I, I always was a bit doubtful about it because, because I'm an architect, I'm interested in built environments and not natural environments. And, and there's some research now which is suggesting that it, it depends what's pleasant to you. And it, it actually may not be about nature, it might be more about what you find attractive and beautiful, but we don't know very much about that. But basically, if you, if you went outside um, or went to a space that was, was really beautiful, it, that would help you to uh, restore your energy much more quickly and your fatigue levels will be low. And they show that actually your product productivity is much better if you have a view of trees outside your window. I think just something to say at a more prosaic level. I think, I think that's very, they're both very important 
important contributions at a very prosaic level routine is very important mm -hmm. so it I mean the human human sort of behavior and decision making is very driven um, by a tendency to do what you did before so it's if you if you, every time if you're working at home and you have a very variable routine then every time you decide what shall I well a, a when shall I start work and b what shall I do now you have a difficult decision to make and that decision will a be um, you know, will take effort but b will tend to be put off so it's it's actually very, I think very important to have very very simple routines that you go through every day um, and if you do the same thing every day, then you don't have those decisions because at a certain time you do what you do and, and then you, the first thing you do is this and off you go. Um, and now there's not, I think there are big personality differences concerning how much routine people want. But for people who find that, work, that balance, trying to create, to, to draw, draw boundaries between their work and home life, particularly from working at home, I think it's, you know, there's, there's a standard thing is just classic sort of uh, training essentially. So like, like animal training, you need to train yourself that when the day ends, I do this, this and this. And then go for a short walk, and then it's stopped. Um, but if the more you, the more things are routine, the more uh, clear those boundaries will be. If I may pick up, I have a, um, and I like to hear both your views uh, in the in the sleep, behavioural and health uh, um, area of research. One thing is very important: our sleep wake cycle is guided by light and darkness, and that's because <coughs> the way we were. And in fact, the, <coughs> the problems of sleep. <clears throat> Sometimes I call that is a disease because since artificial lighting, all these problems have arisen, apart from the poles where there have been some, some adjustments. And I wonder how much, for instance, lighting uh, is considered in building the environment, which is in fact one, one thing which um, guarantees routines uh, in individuals to go from a sleep-wake cycle. Uh, one we recommend as a routine against uh, insomnia, that you create your routine, one of which is to create a soothing environment, uh, dim lighting, because that will reduce your, your stimulus to, to, to wakefulness and will stimulate melatonin, which puts you to sleep, in a sense. Whereas if you are in a very bright light, you will find it more difficult to sleep. And this is physiological, due to hormones. So, uh, uh, and that will guarantee the natural routine in which we have been built, so to wake up with light and go to bed when go to sleep when it's dark, uh, and I wonder for both of you whether you have any indication in terms of designing buildings or, or considering lighting, which is very important in the workplace, but also in the private environment and, and the issues about routine. Uh, yeah, I mean lighting is really important. Um, when it comes to designing a building, the aim should be to increase the amount of natural daylighting so that you are exposed to those rhythms of day and night. Um, and that has shown, been shown to have a big impact on well-being and happiness. Um, however, there are big contradictions really with other requirements. So for example, if we want a low energy building, the main um, mechanism is to seal it and to stop the heat escaping. So actually, windows are the worst bits of a building for heat escaping. So, so the, um, the aim would be to reduce the amount of window space. And actually, most buildings that we work in these days have become deeper and deeper planned. So most people don't have very much natural daylighting, and that's probably for economic reasons as much as anything else. You know, So um, what we need to do, what actually they are trying to do is develop artificial lights which, which more closely mimic the effects or, or, or more closely like natural daylighting because so, so you can get lights now which have some of the same effects as, as natural lighting but I don't think we should try to go down that route I think we should go back to trying to get the most amount of natural daylight into buildings and we've lost that skill because in the past before we had the electric light bulb Architects' designers were very skilled at designing buildings to get the most light. And you'll see, you know, if you look at a Victorian terrace house with the extension at the back, that was simply to get light into the back of the building. It's done very cleverly. And, and you see old buildings, they never have internal bathrooms. Every room has a window, whereas now we've lost the art and the skill of being able to do that. We need to recover that ability. Thank you. Uh, I was going to make a point actually similar to one that Nick made a moment ago, which is about personal preferences and different um, priorities that individuals have. And it seems to me a, a continuing problem <coughs> Excuse me, is that uh, many of our buildings, our organisational structures, organisational cultures are still based around models which are 60 year, 50, 60 years out of date. Um, and we're, not, we're being very slow to change these, to reflect 
changing technology, changing the way people behave. Um, there can be massive changes coming through in the you know, sort of so-called Generation Y, uh, the, 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 the digital generation. We're going to want to do things very, very differently, and our, our structures and cultures, and to some extent physical buildings, don't really allow for that. Yes, I, th I think that's absolutely true. Um, a lot of organisational structure historically is um, in concern with mon monitoring and control. Um, so, trying I mean, one level, you've got you know, office offices taking on the shape of factory organisations, sort of banks of workers with, with, with routinised tasks, all doing the same task. Call centres are a little bit like that now, but most organisations are actually much more fluid. They have a much richer range of tasks going on, enormous varieties of skills. So the structure of organisations, the nature of the, the tasks people are doing are much more diverse, and they don't really lend themselves to this sort of very, very sort of routinised approach to management. So I, and, and I think, in fact, the networking of um, you know, the creation of digital networks actually does change from a man managerial perspective what you need anyway, because in fact you can tell perfectly well how productive people are being because everything is visible. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to ha invade people's privacy, but people are producing, almost everybody in, in, a, in, a, in an office environment at least, or uh, an office environment now distributed across the, across the network, um, is producing information of one kind or another. So it's actually very easy to monitor to what, pe what people are doing. So I think a lot of the sort of hierarchical uh, structures have a, have a different, uh, a different uh, the, the, the rationale for them is different now. That's not to say that organizations need to completely change their shape, and there's still these enormously tricky coordinative functions. In fact, coordination becomes you know, an extremely difficult problem when you've got people with very different sets of skills um, and no single... Uh, manager can understand what all those skills are and whether they're being discharged successfully and whether people are working effectively or ineffectively. I and mean, it's a very, it's a very tricky business. Um, but I think it's it's going to be much. We're going to move, be moving away, I suspect, from very sort of strict hierarchical uh, forms of, of organisation. And, and that is happening. I mean, the organisations are changing shape and getting flatter and and uh, more sort of uh, heterogeneous. And and also, in fact, the the proportion of small organisations to which work is being outsourced um, is is also is also increasing. And in fact, the amount of home working is increasing. There are all sorts of dramatic shifts that we're living through. And I think they happen. They creep up on us. But in fact, the work, workplace. And the kind of structures most of us work in are really quite different um, in aggregate from what they were, say, 20 <coughs> or 30 years ago. I think we've just got time for the last two questions, if that's all right. I've just been <laughs> given the signal to, to wind up. Thank you. Uh, I, I fear my question may, may lead to another panel session sometime, <laughs> but we're not talking about stress in the workplace. But my, my particular interest is decision making and stress. Uh, is, is stress important and good decision making. I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly around uh, areas of financial risk or even mm -hmm. safety risk, a sense where yes. a sense of chronic unease may be important to make a good decision. Yeah, and, that, and that's a huge question, but I'll just say to, to, to keep time under control and fit the other question in, I'll say one thing about it. There's a, uh, a famous and uh, uh, long, sort of ancient law in psychology called the Yerkes Dodson Law, uh, which says that for almost any task, if you're, if you look at uh, the, the amount of stress you're under in doing that task. If you're under very low stress, you'll do it slowly and poorly. If you're under a bit more stress, you'll get better and better. And then there'll be a point, and this point will differ from one person to another, at which you suddenly get worse and worse. So there's this sort of U-shape of performance um, or you, uh, in, in terms of stress level. So you need to be at the right level, but not too much. Uh, and, and in general, when people are uh, so certainly when people are at high, high levels of stress, then their, their performance tends to, tends to be poor, but also that tends to be rather self-perpetuating because obviously then they become more stressed. And so you can get this kind of spiralling. If, if I may add something in the, in the health uh, field, um, stress is difficult to define. Universal <coughs> stress is what is stress for you. The same uh, task could be stressful for you, not stressful for another person. There is a, a huge research in, 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 in social and public health from UCL uh, using this, the, the theory of uh, the locus of control, whereby if you have a high demand and low control job, uh, you have the highest level of uh, health consequences or ill health, including heart disease. So stress causes heart disease. But if you have a high responsibility, high pressure, but high control, your level of disease is not that bad. Uh, that means that obviously you, you can design a two by two uh, square graph and see where you are. You're doing the sort of a, a low demand, low control job, but that's all right, as you say. 
But if you do a, a low control and high demand job, that's where you have to be worried about it. Uh, and that's where I think in terms of health, it comes into place how much control you have of even a highly demanding job. Right. Unfortunately, it had to be a very brief question. You have to be very quick. I do apologise, but we're running a little bit late. If you just... uh, Nick, we talk, you talked earlier on about the IBM experience, <coughs> and I wonder what work you've seen or they're doing on the issues of lack of socialisation as more and more of us are working you know, not in joint premises. Yes, I mean, I, I, do, I only know about this informally. I do know they, they do have some programme of getting people together to meet on sort of annual bases and so on. But I think that's a real problem. That's a really serious problem. And there are little IBM offices you can go to around, the, around Europe, certainly, if you're working from home. But I think it's, it, it's not a very effective strategy, and it's, a very, it's actually a very difficult problem. Right. That's it. Thank you all very much. It's been a very... I'd like to thank the panel. It's been very informative, and thank you very much for the audience participation. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.